Dennis Sarfate making his first appearance. What will you do to defend the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Welcome to the Green Dragon Tavern, where we talk a little treason. I'm Zach Lautenschlager. And I'm Dennis Sarfate. So this week, U.S. Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona decided to uh, misquote Ronald Reagan rather dramatically. Uh, Most of us conservatives are familiar with Reagan's quote, the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Um, Unfortunately, uh, Cardona decided that the quote is, we're from the government and we're here to help. I I just have a hard time believing that was an accident, Dennis. (laughs) Yeah. I don't think so. I, I, it's, it's, it's actually kind of gutsy if you think about it, that when where the government stands right now in the public view of confidence, um, if the government comes knocking on my door, number one, I'm not answering the door, but number two, they're not there to help me. They're there to, to pin something on my, uh, on my record or something on me that, that gets me taken away in cuffs. So uh, I think these guys are all backwards. It goes with the guy who's in charge right now who literally has no idea where he's at. Um, and you know, I keep hearing these indictments. They're, they're coming with these, these indictments on the Biden family and the money and how many, they found dozens of accounts offshore, uh, but nothing ever seems to happen to these guys. And it, maybe it's because you're using the FBI as your Gestapo and, uh, they do exactly what you say, but uh, I'm still waiting for some justice to, to come through on all of this stuff. Well, and when you have people that think they make up reality by opening their mouths, Um, I I think that's part of the picture. Now, maybe our Secretary of Education is so poorly educated and stupid as on the fly to make an unforced error and to reverse the quote. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's it's certainly possible, um, but I think that they're making up their own reality and pretending that it doesn't matter. Well, we won't notice. No one will notice because we control everything they say. Yeah. And Reagan's not here to say, no, that's not what I said. <laughs> you know, uh, that's definitely not what I said. And, and I think that's where they get away with it. Right. If, if that right. person's not available to defend what they, what the original statement is, then we'll just rewrite history. That's what they're trying to do well, in everything. I, I erase think books, it, you know, yeah. and erase everything that's ever happened. And that's what you have. You know what we tell you to know. And I'm talking to our guests today and where we're going with this. That's what COVID was all about. Don't ignore science, ignore logical thinking. We're going to tell you exactly how you should think and how you should feel. And you're going to like it. And for two years plus, some people went along with it. And uh, while others were in the background fighting um, and getting shut down from every angle. But Looking back now, those ones that were fighting <laughs> seem like champions and, and heroes of, of what happened, you know, in the, in the early 2020s. So joining this week is Topher Field coming to us from uh, Australia. Topher, what time of day is it there right now? Uh, it is uh, just 10 o'clock, 10.30 in the morning. In the morning, and it's about 4.30 mm-hmm. in the afternoon while we're recording this here. Um, so thanks for, uh, thanks for taking time. Topher is, uh, a conservative commentator, uh, an actor and, uh, a, I say this in the best way, a professional troublemaker when it comes to <laughs> doing the right thing and standing up against tyranny. Um, it's, I don't think a very well paid profession, but it is an important one. Um, I, uh, have experience in the same profession in the States. So, Topher, uh, we really appreciate uh, the stand that you took during COVID and uh, wanted to talk with you as someone who is an eyewitness to what Australia actually did. The Sentinel is uh, releasing a multi-part explosive documentary called Seals Beat Biden. Uh, The first uh, episode is out the tip of the spear. And what you really see is how close the U.S. came to locking people up in camps and mm. to uh, a level of tyranny that hasn't been seen in America in a long time. I know that you guys came a lot closer to that in Australia in some ways did get there. Um, so w- what was your experience, Topher? Well, firstly, thank you so much for having me on. I love the opening of the show because uh, there's actually a chapter in my new book that is titled, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Uh, and no, I didn't reverse the quote. I, I understood exactly what uh, what former President Ronald Reagan was saying when he when he said that. Uh, and also the mention to this erasing of history. I'm, uh, I'm actually wearing one of my favorite shirts right now, referencing 1984, <laughs> the book, of course. Uh, and that's um, that's where the, you know, we, we have that passage where it says, there is no past, only an ever-changing present in which the party is always right. And 
And this is exactly what we see happening now in this revision of history that the you know, governments want to just continuously be changing what we always knew to be true. Uh, and the party is always right. Don't, don't, don't think back and remember for yourself. Just trust us. We were right all the way through. And that's what we're seeing. And that's what we saw all the way through with Melbourne. Uh, so Melbourne was my home city. I say was because I moved out recently, but I'd lived there since I was two years old. My wife has been there. Her family's been there for five generations. So it was very much home for us. And COVID came along and, and initially... I just, in, in late 2019, when we were first hearing about it, I said, look, it's going to blow over, like just like swine flu, just like various SARS and avian flus have come and gone, uh, this one's going to blow over as well. And then, of course, it didn't. It should have. It should have gone the same way as all these other ones, but it didn't. And I think that's political in nature. I think I think some people saw political opportunity and then others saw financial opportunity in really blowing this thing up and, and making it massive. But by March of 2020, it had reached Australia. Australia has the advantage of being an island in the South Pacific and a very big island, but an island nonetheless. And so it took a little bit longer to get to us. Of course, we've also got opposite seasons to what to what you do in the Northern Hemisphere. So as we were coming into winter, it was autumn uh, in March, and that's when it arrived in Australia, and we, we saw the first of the lockdowns. I was initially... Um, happy to go along with this idea of two weeks to flatten the curve. There is at least, I'm, I, I don't like it, I don't think it's the right thing to do from a liberty perspective, but there is at least a healthcare and an epidemiological argument that can be made to say that it's a good idea. It gives you two weeks to get nurses back from long service leave or out of retirement, uh, get doctors in, clear hospital beds, stock up on PPE, all these sorts of things. There is an argument to be made that says those two weeks could really genuinely make a very big difference to people's lives. But then it began to get strung out one week after another. Oh, we're just going to go another week. We're going to go another week. And by the end of March, I was already onto it. I was I was very, very acutely aware that this I, – I compare it to Charlie Brown. You remember the Charlie Brown cartoons? Charles Schultz, I think was his name. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you, you had um, – what was the character? Lucy would have the American football there yeah. and she's saying to Charlie Brown, oh, no, 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 I won't pull it out of the way this time. I, I promise, I promise, you'll get to kick it this time. And that's exactly what it began to feel like. We were just being strung along one little um, con at a time. So by the end of March, I released a video and I said, I volunteer to be infected with the coronavirus. And the reason I did that was based on on solid epidemiological principles. This is stuff that we've now known for hundreds of years. If you can take a, a younger, healthier population that is very unlikely to get hurt by the coronavirus, my chances of dying are vanishingly small. Me driving from, from where I live back to the city where I used to live is more likely to kill me than the coronavirus was, like just a couple of hours in the car. And if people like me could get infected, isolate so that we don't infect anybody else, and then we could come back out into the community and go about our lives and work our jobs and do our business without being a risk to anyone. And the more people that did that, the more herd immunity was built. And then eventually, once enough people had done that, the elderly and the vulnerable would be able to come out of their own isolation and not be at risk because the the, the community itself had provided them with herd protection. So I was arguing that in March of 2020, and I was mocked at the time. I was told I was a, I was an attention seeker. I was, you know, how dare you use this tragic, terrible situation as just a way of getting attention, all that sort of stuff. You know, accused by people that obviously didn't know their history, didn't know any medical history. Then by April, by late April, I began to join protests and I was invited to speak at a protest by someone who'd been familiar with my work. So I've been a political commentator since 2009 and someone familiar with my work, that that previous decade of work that I'd already done, invited me to be a speaker at the very first anti-lockdown protest and I said yes. And that was really a pivotal moment for me because I've got a clean record. I'm, I'm an absolute clean skin legally speaking. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I served in the Army Reserves. I had an honourable discharge. I've never been in trouble with the law. I've never lost my licence. I've never done drugs. I've never done it. I'm, I'm as clean as they come. And in agreeing to speak at this protest, I was agreeing to, to defy, directly defy the government's rules at the time. They weren't laws, but they were rules that they had in place at the time. And I made the decision when I got there because I was really nervous. The police were already on site. I knew I was going to get arrested that day and who knows what the long-term consequences were going to be. Uh, I was incredibly nervous and I was I was close to chickening out. And in order to stop myself from chickening out, I actually grabbed my phone and I had started a live stream to my Facebook page because I knew that once once the world was watching, or at least you know a few hundred people were watching on my Facebook page, I couldn't chicken out at that point. I'd kind of I'd, I'd bully myself into actually following through. So that's what I did, and I live streamed that. 
in the end, the police, this was the very first protest and the police didn't yet have their marching orders. They weren't shooting at us. They weren't arresting us en masse. They weren't, you know, firing tear gas and doing all the stuff that we saw a little bit further down the line. So what they said was, look, we're going to come back in, in, in one hour and we're going to arrest anyone who's still here. And what we heard was, you've got 45 minutes to do whatever you want to do and just be gone before that hour is up. That's what we heard. And uh, and so I gave my speech and then others uh, spoke as well and we, we you know, held our placards and, and I live streamed all of that. Drove home, looking in my mirrors the whole way, expecting to get arrested at any moment. And I got home safely and I looked online and uh, within two days that live stream was viewed by over 100,000 people. And uh, that was really a seminal moment for me. And that was the beginning of my journey into uh, civil disobedience and, and being one of the more prominent people pushing back against all the lockdowns. Wow. You know, I think it's really important to note and to recognize um, that the, um, the way it went down across Australia, and you have th- it happened different in different parts of Australia, different states or provinces um, dealt with it differently, just as in Canada. Um, but across the board, you had a much more strict uh, crackdown, a much more European perspective, if you will, and um, a lot less, in some ways, from my perspective, perspective pushback from people uh, who, um, unlike some places in America, people just decided they were going to put up with it. Um, now, that certainly happened in the States. Certainly happened uh, in places like New York, California, but in Utah, where I live, a bunch of us went around and just intentionally said, we're not going to do it. And the civil government was was nowhere near wanting to pick that fight. The more people push back, the more people who stand up and say, no, um, there are decisions Mm. that can be made and maybe you should wear a mask in certain situations, but the government may not tell you. And they certainly may not tell you, you have to stay home, you can't go to work, you can't go to church, you can't go to the grocery store. Um, and so, uh, because we had multiple, oh, and, and the government definitely can't tell you, you have to put this in your body. You have to take this or that vaccine, which is really where it starts to go and where you not only lose the ability to provide for your family, you lose your bodily autonomy, which is directly Mm. connected to your right to life. Um, Mm. and so the more people who push back, um, have a, a direct correlation to how fast the government has to back off. How did you see that dynamic playing out in Australia? Well, I learned a lot during those couple of years. And the way that I would put it is this, if, if you believe in limited government, if that's a concept that you believe in, that the government is not God, that it doesn't have all power and can do whatever it wants, if you believe that there are limits on government, then you must believe in limiting your obedience to only those areas where their authority is legitimate. And that's for a very simple reason. We've tried all different ways of limiting government throughout human history. We've tried bills of rights. You know, I could ask you, how's your US Bill of Rights going? I'm guessing the government respects it and never violates it and would never, never dare to tread upon the the, the rights enumerated in the Bill of Rights. I'm guessing that's not how it works. <laughs> that's right. So, so That's to, correct. To, to, yeah, and then, and then you look at the Westminster system of separation of powers, which, of course, the American uh, federal government has as well. You look at the ideas of, of, of having a constitutional monarchy or written constitutions, the Magna Carta, all of these different efforts and attempts that, that the human race has made to try and limit government. All of them fail, every single one of them, because ultimately, in the end, unless people are willing to change their behavior, all of those things are just words on a page. Right. So what actually matters, the only thing that actually works is when the people reach the limit of their obedience. That's where the government reaches the limit of its power, and it can be no other way. So from my perspective, I learned a lot during those couple of years as I reached the limit of my obedience for the first time in my life. Like I said, I'd been a goody two-shoes up until then, and then finally I'm out there um, you know, as this hated minority, and hated is the word. The, the, the government was very good, very clever psychologically at teaching the obedient to hate the disobedient. But I began to protest on a regular basis, and we were playing cat and mouse with the police all the way through the police were arresting anyone that was out there publicly supporting the protests. They would show up at, at you know four o'clock in the morning, six o'clock in the morning, whatever time, with a battering ram and just smash people's doors in, violently arrest them, tackle them to the ground, drag them away. Uh, we were seeing more and more police presence at the protests themselves, and they were becoming less and less tolerant. We began to see roadblocks. If you were trying to get into a protest, there'd be roadblocks there. Uh, so just to give people a paint a bit of a picture, this is the situation we found ourselves in in Melbourne. All businesses that were not deemed essential, which was a, a, a small list, were shut down. You, Anyone caught there, arrested. Uh, in terms of churches, mosques, synagogues, the whole lot, 
completely shut down. You're not allowed to go. Uh, and for a while there, they weren't even allowed to live stream. So the, that got eased a little bit. And then on Sundays, a small crew of essential people were allowed to go there and then live stream a church service. So you could sit on your couch and do church from your couch. Uh, but even for a while there, you couldn't even do that. Playgrounds were shut down. So you were locked in your home. You couldn't leave your home for, for 23 hours a day. You were allowed out for one hour a day. You had to provide an excuse for why you'd left your house. It had to be shopping, essential medical care, um, to provide care for, for someone else who needed it or because you're an essential worker. Those were really the only reason, reasons why you were allowed out of your home uh, and you were allowed out for one hour of exercise per day. So you could, you know, it was your time in the, in the prison yard. You'd, go, you'd get an hour in the prison yard every day. You had to stay within five kilometres, that's about three miles of your house. And if they checked your licence and, and found that you were more than five kilometres away from your house, then you'd, you'd have to answer for that. Otherwise, you'd be arrested or fined. So that was the, the, and there was an eight o'clock curfew. So if you were found out out of your house after 8 p.m., you were arrested. People got arrested for taking their bins out uh, to the curb at night and having a police car drive past at the wrong moment in time. It was, it was absolute madness. We had what came to be known as the Ring of Steel around Melbourne City. And this was a series of roadblocks uh, manned by police and military personnel where you had to provide paperwork to prove that you had a legitimate reason to cross from inside Melbourne City out into rural areas or back again. And this was enforced with such mind, you know, mindless um, bureaucratic rigour that in, in, on two instances that I'm aware of, children died from a lack of medical care because they were on the wrong side of the ring of steel and they, people weren't willing to actually bend the rules and, and get these people to where they needed to be for those children to receive the their, their life-saving care. That happened on two occasions uh, that I'm aware of, once across a state border and once across the Ring of Steel. That was the level of, of um, paranoia that people had about COVID-19. So it was in that context that we were then going out and protesting. And yeah, I'm, I'm going more than five kilometers from my house. I'm definitely not only out there for an hour and I, I certainly can't tick the box for any of the, the reasons to leave home. And so from the moment I step out my door, I'm playing dodge and cops. I'm, I'm actively avoiding roadblocks. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where am I gonna park? How am I gonna get into the agreed location where this protest is gonna start? And of course, if we know where the protest is, so do the police. So they're already there setting up, preparing. We would get into the area and, and what you had to try and do was blend in to the locals that were there. So there would be people who were within their five kilometres who might be out for their hour of exercise walking, or they might be out doing some shopping or these various things. And we had to try and blend in with them until such time as we had enough of a critical mass for a bunch of us to get together really suddenly before the police could really react. And then all of a sudden, instead of them being able to pick us off one at a time, we might have a couple of hundred people that all coalesce around. You know, someone would just unfurl a banner or something like that. Someone had to take a really dangerous sort of first step to give everyone else a rallying point. And then people would rush in to that point and, and try and create a big enough crowd that the police couldn't just pounce and arrest every single person straight away. So from there, you were then trying to avoid getting kettled. The police would try and trap you. They would have, they had up to 2,000 police officers at a time working these protests. And so they had a small army. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's an infantry division. You've, you know, you've got some serious, you've got some serious firepower at that point. Sounds like Let's a super not spreader. <laughs> it's getting 2,000 cops spreader. together. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. And, and they're all armed and wearing body armor and with pepper spray and rubber bullets and all of that. And we're, we are a largely disarmed population and not that I would have uh, approved Were of any armed use with of lethal, anyway. with lethal force. Oh yeah, they have they have pistols with live ammunition in them. Absolutely, um, and then we saw by the time that by the time it really got to its zenith, we saw the anti-terror squad. You know these people that they tell us we need because we have to protect ourselves from bombings and and terrorists, etc. They were being used and deployed on the streets against unarmed protesters. And when I say protest, by the way, it's more what you Americans would call a rally. This isn't right. like Black Lives Matter style burning stuff down. This is a rally. Mm -hmm. Chants and signs and slogans and songs. Sometimes it was actually okay in America. In yeah. yeah, the Sometimes. BLM riots were actually okay during COVID. That was fine. <laughs> that was fine because they were mostly peaceful except for the bits where they weren't. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and I, look, how you get from mostly peaceful to half the city burnt down, I'm not quite sure, but I'm, I'm sure it must be fine because the media told me so. Um, you know, it was more like your January 6, where, where people exactly. show up and then the police pretend that all this violence happened and these are evil people that have tried to take over the government. It was exactly the same kind of thing. So we're there dealing with ever increasing levels of violence as, as weeks go by and we're, we're trying to protest every second week or so. We couldn't, you needed time to recover from a protest because you would run so much and so far trying to not get shot. 
uh, or trying to not get you know hit with a, a canister of tear gas or something like that. And, uh, you know, you'd end up, I, I've been hit with batons, I've been pepper sprayed, I've been tear gassed more times than I care to remember. I never actually got hit with a rubber bullet, which is nice, uh, because the people that did get hit, I mean, one of the very first person to get shot, Matthew Lawson, he was shot at point blank range by a police officer. Now, Matthew, just for context, he was a peacemaker within within the movement. So these, at these protests, some people would get hot headed and they'd throw a water bottle at the police or, or you know, something like that. And he, he took it upon himself to be there at the very front line, defusing people like that. As soon as he saw someone getting too hot headed, he would get in their ear and get in their face and be like, mate, just, just head back into the crowd, get away from the, this contact point here. We don't need you, you know, causing violence because the media are all there with cameras hoping to catch us doing something wrong. So his self-appointed job was defusing situations and ensuring that there wasn't violence. And he ended up being the very first person to get shot with a rubber bullet by Victoria Police. And he actually was shot at point blank range in the stomach. And he's had to have four surgeries repairing organ damage, internal organ damage that was done to him. I mean, this people think rubber bullets are, are, are a laughing matter. They're not. They're called less lethal ammunition. They're not called right. non-lethal. Mm -hmm. And there's a good reason for that. They can kill you. Um, and that was the very first time we saw them used. And then they got used quite a lot after that point. At the absolute height of the madness, we had anti-terror squads driving an armoured vehicle down the streets of Melbourne on which people in full, like, dressed ready to enter a building, ready to breach a building with terrorists inside with automatic, um, you know, weapons, genuine genuine assault weapons, and, and, and I don't say, um, uh, sorry, assault rifles, and I don't mean the politicised assault weapon, the American politicised version, I mean a select fire a uh, detachable magazine mid-caliber rifle. That is what an assault rifle is. It's what most militaries carry. Uh, and they would have those on the streets of Melbourne wearing full body armor, jumping off the side of armored trucks and just assaulting anybody that they that caught their eye. And we have lawsuits ongoing now where people were actually, or in fact, they've actually had to pay compensation out to people who were genuinely just shopping. And they got assaulted by these guys jumping off these armored vehicles. And we've got we've got it on video. They'll be thrown to the ground. These guys would be coming in with their knees, absolutely beating the crap out of these people and then striking them with the butt of their, their weapons. And this is what heavily armed and armored grown men are doing to unarmed, nonviolent civilians on the streets of Melbourne because coronavirus. Right. We yeah, lost. You know, as, as you describe this, it sounds almost so far fetched that you're you're trying to pitch us a movie, right? You're trying to pitch us this movie. Uh, Tom Cruise is going to star in it. Uh, yeah, yeah. But this, you know, I remember seeing it on TV. You know, yeah. there were protests and it was our media uh, dictating that, oh, look at they're going crazy in Australia. It must be these right wing, you know, Trump type yeah. supporters that are starting these rallies. Yeah. That actually gave me a beacon of hope because I was like, well, I'm not the only one. And I knew I was surrounded by a ton of people that were calling this crazy. It started mm -hmm. two weeks, then it was three weeks, and then it was essential mm -hmm. workers. And then it was, mm -hmm. you know, finally the government had enough of it where they started to get haircuts and they were getting caught doing things that we weren't allowed to do. Yeah. Um, it almost looking back, I can't believe we all, we all had to deal with this, right? right? Yeah. It, it almost seems so far-fetched and unreal but this, like you said, they're going to study this, this genera, they're going to study this time period and yeah. there are going to be books and Decades. movies made, and it is going to be glorious yeah. to show the error and the mistakes that were made by the governments across the world. Yeah. Well, I can, I can lay claim to having made the very first movie, which is a documentary called Battleground Melbourne. It was released in early 2022 and uh, it documents that two year period, 2020, 2021 on the streets of Melbourne. It's won 14 awards internationally. Uh, it's a documentary that, that weaves together 20 different interviews that I conducted with everyone from politicians to police officers, to protest organizers, to you know, mums and dads and, and union workers and all the different people that were affected in all different ways. Uh, I weave together those, their stories with uh, found footage. So this is footage that are from people that were there at the protests, et cetera, who then uploaded their footage online. And we were able to uncover that and find that and stitch that into the story as well as news footage and tells the story of uh, what I call it is the fall of the world's most livable city through the eyes of those who risked everything to save it. Uh, it's called Battleground Melbourne. You can actually watch it for free, wow. battlegroundmelbourne.com. So it's a fantastic film. You just need to check it out. Um, it's yeah. definitely something that we uh, appreciate and documents exactly how it happened. It does sound so far-fetched because not even in the most left-leaning bastions like New York City or in larger cities in California um, or Chicago, 
did you have that level of intensity? You you might have gotten mm-hmm. arrested. There were people who were going to chase you down and say, ah, 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 don't do that. But that's about mm-hmm. as bad as it got here. Um, mm-hmm. I pretty firmly believe that even in California, if uh, Newsom had decided to go that way, which I'm sure it was talked about, there'd have been people from outside, there'd have been people in Sacramento who would have mm-hmm. gone to hot war and would have started shooting. Um, yeah. I don't think hey. there's any question um, Tover, the, do you do you do you think Australia ever falls for this again? It's an interesting one. Let, let me go into the psychology of what happened a little bit. Just in in answering that question, it's it's a it's a more nuanced question than you might suspect. What people don't fully appreciate yet, and what I think will be studied for generations, is that for some people, these were the best years of their lives. Obviously not for people like myself who, who pushed back against it and said, hey, this isn't right. But for some people, these were actually the very best years of their lives. They've never had it better. And what happens is you've got Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is a, a simple triangle diagram. And down the bottom, you've got the essential uh, needs that people have for life. In order to live, you need oxygen, you need shelter, you need food, you need water. And then as you move up the hierarchy, once you've got those things, you can start to concern yourself with, with you know, other things like community and family and, and a sense of belonging. Then once you've got that, you can start to say, well, do I like my job? You know, if you're struggling just to pay bills and put food on the table, you're not really asking yourself whether you like your job. You're just doing your job. And so as you move up the hierarchy, your priorities change. And then eventually, if you can get all the way to the very peak, the very pinnacle, Where you're at there is this thing that Maslow called self-actualization. It's like living your best life. You wake up every day with a sense of purpose and you're excited about what you do because you've got such a sense of, of value and belonging and purpose and meaning in everything that you do in life. The reality of life is that most of us live somewhere in between those two extremes. Most of us in the Western world, we're not that worried about our survival. We've got food, we've got shelter, you know, we know we're going to turn the tap on and the water's going to come out, okay? But at the same time, we're not at self-actualization. We're not living our best lives either. We're all in a blob somewhere in between those two. What happens when lockdowns are introduced is a whole bunch of people are shoved towards the bottom of that hierarchy. These are the self-employed, the business owners, uh, people who, who you know, don't have you know, ca- casual workers, people who don't have reliable fixed income from jobs that they can do at home. And all of a sudden, they're worried about their survival at a level they haven't been potentially at any other point in their life. They're pushed all the way to the bottom. That's obvious. What's less obvious is what happens to the other half. These are people who are laptop workers, office workers, government employees, people on welfare, people who are already retired. Not only are they not pushed towards the bottom, but actually they are given, they are invited into a once in a lifetime opportunity to move to the very, very top where they can wake up every day with a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, a sense of belonging. And all they have to do to get that is to buy into the official narrative and say, staying home saves lives. I'm going to wear a mask. I'm not just going to wear a mask. I'm going to take a photo of myself wearing a mask. I'm going to post it online and put that frame around my around my Facebook profile picture and do all of these performative acts, this performative obedience that allows them to say, I'm a part of the club. I'm a part of those that, that special group of people that are doing the right thing and we're saving grandma. And so for those people, not only were they not pushed towards the bottom of the hierarchy of needs, but actually they were invited to get to the very, very top and millions upon millions of people gleefully accepted that invitation. What that means now is that you've got this entire, these millions of people for whom those COVID years were actually the most fulfilling, the most thrilling, the most satisfying and purpose-filled years of their lives. And when you and I come along and say, hey, that was the wrong thing to do. We shouldn't have done that. We shouldn't have done it that way. They're not hearing a debate about policy and about health and epidemiology. They're hearing you challenge the best years of their life. Mm-hmm. So to, to come back to your question, would it happen again in Australia? What we have now is an entrenched group of people who just lived the best years of their life. And they know that they will probably never get that ever again. They were the best years they've ever had and they're probably the best years they will ever have. But if someone gives them the opportunity to have it back, they will jump at the chance. They would love to see lockdowns come back in again. They would love to see protesters being beaten up in the streets again. Nothing would make them happier. What you have at the other end of people like myself who opposed it the very first time. And what you've got then is all the people in the middle. 
and the people in the middle, I'm fairly convinced, will side with the protesters if lockdowns are brought in again. I think that what would happen is instead of protests taking 18 months to get momentum, it would take a week. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden, we would be, you know, by the time, by the by the end of our protest movement in Melbourne, by the time we wound it up, there were hundreds of thousands of us coming out on the streets of Melbourne. That's where we would start second time around. But that group of people that loved it the first time, they will love it the second time and every other time after that. Hmm. Good point. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think you have the same. The only reason, that, you know, there's a difference in how things went down and how things happened between the U.S. and Australia, for example, or, or many other Western nations. Uh, but I don't think the difference is in the numbers of people. Um, I think that's true here as much as it is there. Mm-hmm. You certainly saw that mindset. And however we want to analyze the way, you know, the way that particular personality or mindset works, um, it, I think it's rampant here. I think the difference mm-hmm. is um, you have people who pushed back harder and faster. I think that, and I think that you're absolutely correct. The more people stand up and say, yeah, no, you're outside the bounds of government. Mm-hmm. This is not a mm-hmm. proper action for government to take. You do not have the jurisdiction. You do not have the authority. Mm-hmm. And we simply will not comply. We're not going yeah. to do that. Um, I think that the, <laughs> the more you have people who, who push back sooner, the better it is and the faster it will uh, go away. We were talking earlier about um, the reality that um, a <laughs> uh, the narrative continues to ooze and slide towards, yeah, none of that ever really happened. Um, we, mm. we never really even made any of those mistakes. Mm. Um, so that eventually um, no one is going to admit that uh, people who pushed back against uh, lockdowns and maybe even mandatory vaccines were right. We're just going to pretend mm. that I'm not sure that ever really happened. And I think yeah. that that's where we, we begin to see, no, uh, I think we actually won that one. Well, this is, this is the revision of history, and that's also why I was so determined to make the documentary Battleground Melbourne, to document what happened in Melbourne, because I've got them in their own words. I've got the video footage. I've got the eyewitness testimony. It's all there. And by having it on the internet for free, anyone can go there, battlegroundmelbourne.com, watch the doco for free. It's won 14 awards. It's not a bad doco. Um, and understand what really happened there because that freezes it in time and they can't really shy away from that anymore. Um, now, obviously, they're trying to. They're, they're trying to rewrite history. That, that, you know, there is no past, only an ever-changing present. It's that, you know, that 1984 quote again. They're trying to do that. But I think it's incumbent upon people like myself who were there and, and anyone else who can, to, and, you know, yourself with the documentary that you're doing to do with the military and the vaccine mandates, Let's get that on the on the record. Let's pull it together in a way that people can watch and uh-huh. digest and, and and remember, and it's emotionally impactful. And let's make sure it's on the record forever, so that they can't rewrite this piece of history. That's right. That's exactly right. So please do check out Battleground Melbourne. Um, you can also mm. check out Topher's new book. Um, it's called Good People Break Bad Laws, which I think is a fantastic title. It's a great title. Um, yeah. It is historically significant. It doesn't just mean it's not just an explanation, and I'm not. Sure, I'm sure you you meant it this way, Topher. But that's mm. not just an explanation. Uh, that is a statement of moral reality. If it is a mm. bad law, um, mm. and it is bad enough then you are obligated to push back at some level. Mm. Well, if I, can, if I can comment on that for a moment, this is, this is my five-word paraphrase of thousands of years of political philosophy and, and history. In particular, most recently, Martin Luther King Jr.'s statement that one has a legal and moral obligation to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral obligation to disobey unjust laws. Now, of course, in, in today's TikTok generation, ain't nobody got time to hear that many words. So I boiled it down to just five. Five words, good people break bad laws. That's thousands of years of, of philosophy, theology, history, wrapped up in, in five words that you can put on a T-shirt, you can put on the front cover of a book. That's right. The link uh, to the book will be available in the show notes. So wherever you are watching or listening, you'll be able to go straight there. Obviously, you can also mm-hmm. Google it. Um, and, uh, in that same vein, um, for those of you who haven't heard yet, Seals Beat Biden part one is available. Um, you can watch it at sealsbeatbiden.com. 
and to recognize and realize that even when you are isolated and alone, and it seems like you're the only person saying this, you have to yeah. uh, dodge the cops, for example. Uh, you do not have enough background or back, uh, backup, enough support. Or if in the U.S. you're a service member, no one else is saying anything, you're going to lose your career if you speak up. The reality is, and one of the major takeaways and lessons from the COVID era, is that is not true. All it takes is a couple people to speak up, and everyone else looks around and says, you know what, they're right. We are no longer in the era where uh, government or the evil in government, the evil people in government, are trying to boil the frog slowly, if you will. In the United States, mm -hmm. that's happened for decades and decades and decades. Slight changes, slow changes, slow changes. Um, now we are facing uh, a different kind of government. There was an opportunity to exploit a fantastic uh, international crisis, and they took that opportunity. But the reality is the pushback is much higher, much stronger. And when you stand up and say, no, that's not right, um, that is wrong. Um, it's fascinating how well it works out. So, Topher, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Anything else you want to say? Look, thank you so much for taking an interest. I, I'm of the view that our experience in Melbourne and the lessons learned out of that that you'll see in the documentary Battleground Melbourne uh, and you'll read in the book Good People Break Bad Laws, which is at goodpeoplebreakbadlaws.com and don't forget to get the discount code from uh, the Sentinel Dispatch, the Green Dragon podcast, so that you can get a discount on that. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, the, 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 what the lessons that I've distilled and compiled into those two places are lessons that everyone that believes in freedom need to read and learn because uh -huh. you've got the opportunity to learn those the easy way by watching and by reading. Uh, we had to learn them the hard way because we didn't have a good grounding in this when, when everything kicked off in Australia. And I don't want that to happen to anyone else. I want everyone else to be thinking about this already and to be making appropriate arrangements in their own lives to put themselves in a position where they can make those courageous decisions and make the right decisions when their conscience calls on them and not be compromised by their circumstances uh, into, into making bad decisions that they have to live with for the rest of their life. Thank you Amen. so much for your work. We appreciate you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you next week. <laughs>